From every mountain and valley the world over are flowers and plants of simple beauty. Some hold a natural wonder, chemicals that soothe pain and inspire euphoria. At times they've been hailed as a gift of heaven, but in the last century they've been condemned as a scourge of man. Once, marijuana, cocaine, opium, ecstasy, LSD, even heroin were perfectly legal. Today, they compel a war on drugs. Did these plants and drugs change, or did we? Drugs are menacing our society. It's like a five-hour orgasm. Used wisely can produce the greatest ecstasy that man knows. Marijuana has been an enemy of the state since the first federal law was enacted against it in 1937. Since that time, 20 million Americans have been arrested, convicted, and incarcerated for using the most popular drug in the world. Your Honor, in this case, the state waives trial of the defendant, Ralph Wiley. It is convinced that he is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. The law is only one deterrent and not that effective. The government relied on something else, education films. This harmless looking cigarette is cloaked in many innocent disguises. But light the match, inhale the smoke, and it becomes an invitation to your own murder. They had to now control something that was growing all over the United States as a weed. So they relied mostly on words. Uh, because they didn't have many other resources to uh, to devote to it. I think a lot of people have seen Reefer Madness. That's bitter. That's more like it. I know you like that really well. Just take a puff. Though marijuana is now a household name, there was a time when it was an obscure drug used only by the fringes of society. That, some argue, is the reason why it was criminalized. Drugs are illegal be because they do cause problems. The ones that are illicit drugs, health problems, um, uh, crime-related problems, violence-related problems. But it's also true that none of the drugs currently uh, illegal became illegal before they were most closely associated with uh, what were commonly regarded as deviant groups. One of the girls was telling me about a new cigarette that peps you up. Oh, you mean reefer? Yes, that's the name of them. Would you like to try one? Sure, why not? I'm supposed to be on the loose. Okay. Marijuana's trip from a weed to America's arch enemy in a $400 billion drug war begins with its chemistry. Smoking pot draws the active ingredient delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, into the lungs and onto the brain. There, it suppresses the neurons, causing a distortion of perception in time, a lack of coordination, and sometimes uncontrollable hilarity. Within four seconds of the first drag, muscles relax, eyes redden, pulse rate quickens, euphoria, heightened sensitivity, or paranoid feelings arise in the user, an experience that dates back to the dawn of time. Herodotus records some of the earliest uses of cannabis by the Scythians, and what they did was they would build a big bonfire in the middle of the camp, and they would heap a bunch of marijuana on top of it, and then they would throw a tent over it, and they would all go under the tent and breathe the smoke. And that way they consumed it. Next to opium, marijuana is one of the planet's oldest medicines. Ancient Chinese herbalists applied it to stomach pain, menstrual cramps, malaria, and consumption. According to Indian mythology, Shiva, the Hindu goddess of creation and destruction, endowed man with the plant for a joyful pastime. An apt legacy for the drug of the generation that preached free love, challenged authority, 
and was out to change the world. Cannabis grows anywhere but the Arctic Circle. The earliest record of its use begins in ancient China and India. From the east, cannabis migrated to the rest of the world. Arab traders brought it from the Ganges Valley to North Africa and Spain. From Spain, the conquistadors carried it to the Americas. It was a prized source of fiber for rope and canvas, essential ingredients for ships. In fact, the word canvas comes from the Latin cannabis. But it was another conqueror who introduced the plant to Europe. 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte triumphs in Egypt. During the conquest, his army is introduced to an intoxicant unseen in Europe. Unlike in France, where intoxicants are drunk, this one is smoked. The soldiers fancy cannabis over brandy because it doesn't cause hangovers and carry it back to France as a spoil of war. In Paris, it finds favor with the Bohemian set, with artists, authors, students, and prostitutes. The poet Baudelaire writes under its spell. One must be forever drunken if you would not feel the horrible burden of time that bruises your shoulders and bends you to the earth. You must be drunken without cease, with wine, with poetry, with what you please. Be drunken without end. From Paris, it travels to London as a smoking substance and an extract in medicine. Ladies of high society eat hashish confections to lower fevers, ease stomach pains, or any ache at all. Even a queen finds a use for the drug. Queen Victoria used it for menstrual cramps. Um, it was used for insomnia, for, especially for tuberculosis patients who had lost their appetites. Um, it was also used recreationally. The drug's next stop is New York, where cannabis and hashish become one of the many ingredients in America's unregulated patent medicine industry. The writer Fritz Hugh Ludlow uses it as a recreational intoxicant after first taking it for a toothache. With continued use, Ludlow becomes addicted. He writes about his experience in Diary of a Hashish Eater in 1857. When I shut my eyes, I dwelt in a delicious land of dreams. On the wings of a speechless music, I floated through the air, and in the cloud valleys played hide-and-seek with meteors. Sometimes these accounts magnified and glamorized the drug experience and encouraged many people to follow suit. Interestingly enough, Fitzhugh Ludlow became one of the most ardent and earliest supporters of drug regulation through law in the 19th century, writing quite a few stories for Harper's and for various popular magazines on, on drug addiction in the United States, trying to bring awareness to it. Congratulations, now you'll start living. <laughs> That's because your troubles are all gone. Try another puff. In the 19th century, marijuana was far from the recreational drug of a future time. By and large, its only use comes from patent medicines. Americans know little of smoking it as an intoxicant, a custom widespread in the East. That is, until Abdul Hamid II, Sultan of Turkey, makes a very special birthday gift to the American people. 1876. A world's exposition is held in Philadelphia to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. On display are the wonders of the modern world, among them the telephone and the personal printing press, otherwise known as the typewriter. The industrial age has arrived. At the Turkish pavilion, the Sultan Abdul Hamid II makes a gift of a rare and exotic treat. The crown is introduced to smoking marijuana in what may have been the first pot party in the United States, and perhaps the biggest, until Woodstock 93 years later. The Sultan's gift ignites a wave of Yankee ingenuity. Seeing dollar signs in another idle pleasure, entrepreneurs open Turkish smoking parlors in the north. 
Sometimes people would go to these places in great secrecy, sort of as a lark, and they'd be society matrons as well as prominent businessmen. And they would either smoke hashish or eat hashish-laced confections. At a time when the temperance movement is trying to ban alcohol and close saloons, smoking parlors could have been the alternative way to get high. But the parlors close. Liquor, not cannabis, continues to be the country's drug of choice until a constitutional amendment bans booze and America rediscovers marijuana. New Orleans, 1920. America's second largest port is America's number one party city. In this brawling place, where blacks, French, Cajun, Spanish, American, Europeans, and Chinese live, work, and play, a new music emerges out of the constant clash and commotion of culture. The music is jazz. Marijuana and jazz go together like a melody and lyrics. Where jazz goes, reefers follow. But there's another reason for its widespread use. In 1920, it is the only legal drug in town. Even here, where everything the flesh desires can be had, prohibition keeps the flow of liquor out of sight. The choice of a new intoxicant becomes the perfectly legal weed, shipped in from the Caribbean, Mexico, and South America, and sold like cigarettes in jazz clubs, markets, and pharmacies. It is cheap and popular. But even in paradise, there's trouble. New Orleans is in the midst of a crime wave. Murder dominates the headlines and attracts William Randolph Hearst's attention, eager for a sensational story to sell. New Orleans was a sort of a source, the beginning of uh, concern about marijuana. They saw it as linked to crime, violent crime, or even um, predatory crime. Uh, also, sometimes it seemed to be related to murders, uh, to rape and so on. Hearst coins the phrase marijuana menace and prints lurid tales about the drug's capacity to cause rape, murder, and mayhem. Just as reports of cocaine-crazed Negroes a decade ago had stirred lawmakers to ban cocaine, headlines and stories of the marijuana menace were affecting cannabis the same way. Society worries about its members who are not in control of their mind. So in order to prevent chaos in society, limit the use of the product or the thing that's inducing those kinds of effects. State lawmakers were quick to ban a drug that they identified with black violence. In 1924, Louisiana joins 14 other states banning the distribution of marijuana for non-medical purposes. And it gets back to the scapegoat. So you can scapegoat different racial groups, you can sca scapegoat the uh, lower classes, um, you can use the drug to do the scapegoating for you. You can attack them because they're using the drug. Slowly and surely, it will be banned across the country, state by state, for one reason or another. In the Southwest, the reason for a ban on pot was economics and prejudice. They were worried about all these Mexicans down on the Texas border who were, uh, it was the depths of the Depression. And these Mexicans had been uh, a very useful labor force uh, in the 20s when we needed them but now as the depression you got all these gringos in the bread line you sure as hell don't need all these mexicans so how could we stigmatize them and get rid of this cheap labor force and get them out of here according to the san antonio gazette quote the men who smoke this herb become excited to such an extent that they go through periods of near frenzy and worse it is always aggressive as the crimes which have been committed in garrisons armories, barracks, and the humble suburbs of Mexico. In 1931, Mexican repatriation becomes law. Mexicans who don't go quietly are subject to varying forms and degrees of harassment. Many are charged with vagrancy. Others are arrested for violation of new state marijuana laws, laws that are often an excuse to drive Mexicans out of the country. So in Texas, for example, if you got caught with one joint, you could get sent to jail. You could get sent to jail for life. In fact, there were um, uh, campaigns in some of the states for the death penalty, and there are cases of um, people serving many, many, many years, decades, in um, in jails for possession. 
Except for a handful of states in the Southwest, marijuana is still legal in the United States. But that will change soon after Harry J. Anslinger, the nation's top drug enforcement agent, takes office at the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. But first, Anslinger must convince Congress to do something it has never done before, outlaw a weed. His chief tactic is to convince Congress and the public that a weed is the cause of sex and murder, a message that scares an already fearful Depression-era America. I had to kill him before they killed me. I had to kill him. Can't you understand? I had to kill him. They kill me unless I kill him. Can't you understand? The History Channel now returns to hook illegal drugs and how they got that way. Nineteen thirty, the gaiety of marijuana collides with the nation in despair. Across the United States, the Great Depression has brought joblessness, bread lines, and above all, fear to America. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But the nation's fear is not just economic. There are fears of crime and gangsters, unions and communists, immigrants and even alcohol. Since 1920, alcohol has been banned by a constitutional amendment. But after 14 years, the law is repealed. The government now focuses on narcotics under a new federal bureau. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics was, was unprecedented in that it was the sole uh, autonomous uh, bureau charged with enforcing uh, narcotics legislation uh, in 1930. It is headed by a 38-year-old Harry J. Anslinger. He had had no particular experience with drugs, and, but he came in and what he was was a complete a bureaucrat. Uh, that is, he wanted to protect his agency. Uh, he wanted to uh, keep his budget going. To Anslinger, there is nothing glamorous about fighting drugs. But soon he sees that it is one of the most important issues of his time, endorsed by some of the country's most powerful men, like publisher William Randolph Hearst. Anslinger went to visit Hearst at San Simeon Castle. I guess it was one time. And Hearst told him that he personally wrote all of the anti-drug editorials in the Hearst newspapers. And I think that uh, Anslinger himself felt that this was a uh, kind of a disgusting subject, like maybe um, uh, being commissioner of garbage or something like this. And he was just astounded that anyone would, you know, in, who's really important would care about it. The Bureau's efforts have been aimed at fighting heroin and cocaine, but with Anslinger's arrival in 1930, marijuana is the new drug problem born out of the trouble in the Southwest with Mexican migrant workers. Anslinger's first battle with marijuana is over who will police it. There are no federal laws against the drug, and he wants to keep it that way, leaving the states to control it, not the federal government. He had tried to get the states to adopt a uniform narcotic law, which would include cannabis. And that would allow each state to decide how much of its resources it wanted to put out for the control of marijuana or cannabis. And it wouldn't touch his budget or his agents. That had some success, uh, but not complete. There was continued pressure on the government in Washington to do something about these Mexican immigrants who smoked marijuana and went into town on the weekends and, and created havoc. Texas, California, Arizona, and Colorado insists it's the federal government's responsibility to do something, but Anslinger resists. He has no interest in staking a career on combating a weed. He has only a staff of 300 and a $1.5 million budget to battle drugs the world over. He wants to avoid a law that will be difficult to enforce and offers a different approach. He wanted silence. If you had to say something, you made it sound as awful as possible. And I say marijuana is a killer drug. But by and large, there was nothing they could do about it. There was no real big action. They didn't have the funding. They didn't have the people. And um, he, I remember he said to me once, 
I was driving uh, around the upper Potomac, and I was crossing the bridge, and I just parked on the bridge. And I got out, and I looked, and there was marijuana plants as far as you could see. And he said, I said to myself, and they want me to wipe this, this out. Anslinger can do nothing to stop the push from states of the Southwest for a federal law against marijuana. The issue is less about the dangers of the drugs and more about politics. Marijuana is entangled in immigration problems. I remember when I interviewed Harry Anslinger about it, uh, he said we weren't having any trouble with it. Uh, you could get it in Harlem, he said, and it just it was not a problem. Uh, but the, the pressure came from the Southwest and the West, where the uh, Mexican immigrants were seen as a unnecessary and uh, dangerous surplus population. And so there was a tremendous campaign to try to push the uh, Mexican immigrants back into Mexico. And marijuana got mixed up in, in that, because there was no question that they grew marijuana and smoked marijuana. In the end, the southwestern states prevail upon Anslinger to do something. Hesitant as he may have been, the pressure is on for Anslinger to use the power of the federal government to control marijuana. Ever the bureaucrat, Anslinger changes his position and becomes a leading warrior against marijuana. The Treasury Department intends to pursue a relentless warfare against the despicable dope peddling vulture who preys on the weakness of his fellow man. His chief weapons are movies that express exaggerated dangers of the drug. The truth is that every reefer is loaded with immorality and bestial perversions, brutality, murder, sex crimes, insanity or suicide. While a propaganda war against marijuana is underway, Anslinger begins working to draft a law. But what kind of law? Like all federal drug prohibition in the early 20th century, the Constitution stands in the way. He finds a way around that in a new law passed to ban machine guns. A law was passed called the National Firearms Act, uh, which said that you could not give, borrow, or transfer a machine gun to anyone without a machine gun transfer stamp. And it turns out they aren't, the government would not make any machine gun transfer stamps. So this went up to the Supreme Court on the grounds that this couldn't be legitimate uh, taxing measure because they weren't doing anything to get the taxes. It was actually just a way to stop machine guns being distributed. The Supreme Court ruled the National Firearms Act was legal, and its use of stamps, even though purposely not available, was legitimate. Anslinger now has a model for a national ban against marijuana. Anslinger told me that the general counsel of the Treasury Department came into his office holding this decision by the uh, Supreme Court saying, look, we finally we have a way to go after marijuana. Anslinger's idea to make marijuana illegal is simple. Anyone involved in its use, distribution, sale, or transfer will be required to get from the government a marijuana tax stamp. But the catch is, the government will only make a token number of tax stamps available. But can he convince Congress that a weed is as dangerous as a machine gun? Or your son, or yours, or yours, or yours. The History Channel now returns to Hook, illegal drugs and how they got that way. On April 27, 1937, hearings begin before Congress on the first federal law to control marijuana. Anslinger hopes to convince Congress that marijuana is dangerous and that they will enact a law like the one that banned machine guns. I think his attitude toward marijuana uh, was that it was not as serious as cocaine and heroin. But you wouldn't know that publicly because one of the strategies against marijuana was to describe it in so horrible and disgusting a way that no one would be tempted to try it once. What's the matter with you, son? Anslinger tells Congress the drug makes the user insane or worse. Oh, nuts. I didn't do it on purpose. Of course you did. But rather than argue with them, the mother stoops to pick it up, and when she does, Elvin takes that heavy frying pan from the stove and kills his mother with it. 
This is exactly what happened and how it happened. In fact, he said... Anslinger also tells Congress marijuana is the stepping stone or gateway to heroin and cocaine. One more or I'll be floating. I want something stronger. How much have you got? He adds that it is the assassin of youth. One of the cases that he was, was uh, constantly presenting in these congressional hearings was uh, the case of Victor Licata, who was a young boy in Florida who cut up his family with an ax. And uh, according to Harry Onslinger, he did this after smoking a marijuana joint. He then went out and, and chopped up his mother and father. But what Anslinger omitted in his testimony, as was uh, published uh, several days later in the Tampa newspaper, that Licata uh, was probably schizophrenic, and uh, there's very little probability that marijuana was the cause and effect of, of the terrible crime he committed. Not a very nice thing to look at, but this is marijuana. And there's nothing beautiful about marijuana. Well, the officer drew his gun, reached for the closet door, and pulled out Victor. Anslinger tells Congress that school children are using marijuana. That assertion results in the only testimony against the law. Dr. William Woodward of the American Medical Association testifies that for all the complaints about marijuana's danger to school children, there was no evidence to back it up. Congress disregards his testimony. They just attacked him viciously. They said, how can you come down here trying to interrupt us when we're trying to do something good for the American people and so forth? Well, it turns out their argument with him had nothing to do with marijuana. They just chopped him into pieces and verbally uh, excoriated him in front of this congressional hearing and then lied about what he said. Hearst follows the hearings, adding extra newspaper runs to cover the news in Washington and headlining the evils of marijuana. Across America, independent movies add to the propaganda, bombarding the public. The most famous, Reefer Madness, warns of the perils of smoking marijuana, as stated by Anslinger and Hearst. Didn't come from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, but Anslinger's Bureau did endorse it. He did support it. In fact, in the opening scene, when uh, the high school principal is talking to an audience of parents, he refers to the Bureau of Narcotics uh, several times. On Capitol Hill, Anslinger wins. Congress passes the Marijuana Tax Act, the first federal law against the drug. The Southwest gets the federal law they wanted. After five days of hearings, the marijuana tax law goes to Congress for a vote. It's passed within weeks by roll call vote. President Roosevelt signs the bill on August 2nd. It takes effect October 1st. Perhaps one of Anslinger's most significant contributions to fighting drugs is that he, more than any other individual, demonized drugs. I don't know that Anslinger lied to Congress, but he was an effective propagandist, we might say. The law requires that anyone wishing to buy, sell, distribute, or transfer marijuana must pay a tax and have a stamp. The penalty for failure to do so is five years in jail, a $2,000 fine, or both. But like the machine gun law, the government doesn't make the marijuana stamps available. There was another problem, too, and that was that in order to get the license, you had to have the marijuana in hand. But if you had the marijuana in hand without the license, you had already violated the law. Two days after the law goes into effect, the first offender of the Marijuana Tax Act, Samuel Caldwell, is arrested in Colorado. Four days later, he is convicted and sentenced to four years in jail and a $1,000 fine. Anslinger flies in from Washington to see justice done. So begins the federal government's effort to punish marijuana users. One year after its ban, Anslinger's law runs into a powerful critic. It was none other than the mayor of America's biggest metropolitan city, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia of New York. LaGuardia commissions a group of medical professionals from the New York Academy of Medicine to study his city's marijuana problem. This blue ribbon panel visits schoolyards, interviews principals, even tests the effects of the drug on adults. After four years of study, the following conclusions are drawn. Smoking marijuana does not lead to addiction. Marijuana smoking is not widespread among schoolchildren. 
marijuana is not a determining factor in major crimes. Publicity concerning the catastrophic effects of marijuana use in New York City is unfounded. Ironically, LaGuardia obtained the pot used in his study from Anslinger. And then when the LaGuardia report came out, Anslinger felt betrayed. <laughs> that was the end of it, scientific research in marijuana as far as he was concerned. No matter what the scientific basis for LaGuardia's study, he is pressured to tow the party line. In the Big Apple, marijuana will remain an illegal drug. Through World War II, marijuana arrests drop. But ever wise to the power of the press, Anslinger begins targeting celebrities and musicians to grab headlines. He arrests jazz drummer Gene Krupa for possessing marijuana, who spends 87 days in jail. Actor Robert Mitchum is busted, and his career is almost shattered after he's arrested at a pot party. But there will be new drugs to combat. One other, legal for the time being, is making history on the battlefields of World War II. The History Channel now returns to hook illegal drugs and how they got that way. Of all the new technologies Germany uses in the Second World War, one touches the common soldier and the Fuhrer alike. It is the synthetic chemical amphetamine, more commonly known as speed. The Blitzkrieg could just as easily have been called Speedkrieg. Everybody was amazed uh, how fast the German panzer troops rushed across Europe westward towards the lowlands. Couldn't believe they could just keep going night and day and so forth. And it was later learned that they were dispensing uh, large amounts of amphetamines to these troops. Hitler is injected as many as five times a day with methamphetamine, a supercharged amphetamine. Scholars claim Hitler's mad rants and blunders were the result of his addiction to the drug. It is also used in the Japanese war effort, given to the Imperial ground forces and kamikaze pilots. The drug of the Axis war machine is a stimulant. It affects the sympathetic nervous system to increase alertness and decrease fatigue. Amphetamines stimulate the adrenal gland to increase spontaneity, initiative, confidence, and a sense of well-being. Amphetamines are commonly associated with appetite suppression, but the drug was first introduced as a lung decongestant, the benzedrine inhaler, nicknamed Benny in Germany in 1932. It would clear up your sinuses and, and, and do a lot of other things. It wasn't long before people discovered that if you break the inhaler, and take the cotton swab, the little cotton swab, uh, which holds all of the uh, amphetamine. Some people just swallowed it whole, other people dissolved it in coffee or what have you. Well, I was just wondering about those bennies and things we've been fooling around with. A benny. A benny? You mean a benzedrine tablet? This method of ingestion is commonly called poppin' bennies. At the time, no one knew how highly addictive and powerful a stimulant amphetamines were. It, it was quite euphorogenic. It uh, gave people a sense of confidence. Uh, life seemed brighter. Uh, you didn't have to sleep as much. You could overcome uh, fatigue. It made doing boring things uh, more interesting. <laughs> and of course, weight loss. 1946, amphetamines find their way into post-war society. In Japan, the market is flooded with vast amounts of the drug. In America, housewives take speed to feel better. Amphetamines are to the 50s what opiates were in the past. Truck drivers take them to stay up for days, like dock workers who once used cocaine to work through the night. And artists and writers who used laudanum a century ago now pop bennies for kicks and inspiration. Like author Jack Kerouac, while popping Benzedrine, he writes on the road in 20 days in 1955. Meth's the all-American drug. Meth was invented for Americans. It, 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 it really embodies all of the values that we, that we hold dear. Industriousness, um, hard work, um, uh, uh, 
basically um, enthusiasm for accomplishing tasks. It was the most widely prescribed drug in America's history. The appeal of amphetamines cuts across all walks of life. One of the most famous users is the newly drafted Elvis Aaron Presley. In October 1958, Presley begins a tour of duty in West Germany. As an army GI, a sergeant introduces him to speed. From this point on, the king of rock and roll is hooked for the rest of his life. Drugs must be prescribed by a doctor and prepared by a licensed pharmacist. And physicians were the real pushers of this drug. Uh, you're a little depressed? Here, let me, sub let me prescribe some form of amphetamine. You want to lose weight? Here, let me prescribe some amphetamine. Uh, you say you don't have enough energy? I mean, the, the reasons were le legion. In 1946, a physician by the name of W.R. Bett uh, published a paper in which he claimed there were 39 medical reasons for prescribing amphetamines. And they were everything from hiccups to schizophrenia. By the 1960s, amphetamine use was a hidden epidemic. On the other hand, marijuana, once kept behind closed doors, is openly used. Unlike methamphetamine, a legal drug, marijuana has been outlawed by the Marijuana Stamp Act of 1937. Users face fines and jail sentences under federal law. But it is the latest drug fad, the favorite of baby boomers, despite these potentially harsh penalties. Marijuana is kind of a, of a hybrid. It has some features that are, that are like LSD. It also doesn't produce physical dependence, and it doesn't produce overdose deaths. And, and the fact that it doesn't do those two things makes it seem like it's not, quote, an addictive drug. It has an appeal to people who are uh, smart uh, and who are interested in uh, going beyond the conventional uh, boundaries in, of their behavior. <laughs> 33 years after the Marijuana Tax Act, its constitutionality was questioned in the Supreme Court. The man who led the charge to change the law was the man who told a generation to tune in, turn on, and drop out, Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary, the LSD guru, argued that in order to get the license, one had to break the law. In other words, one had to have the marijuana before you got the license, and therefore you were already in violation of the law, and therefore getting the license was simply self-incrimination. The Supreme Court agreed with him and overturned the law. In the slam of a gavel, the federal law that banned marijuana vanished. Until 1914, most people believed the Constitution upheld one's right to ingest any substance one wanted. Besides, a drug that made you feel better was perceived as good. But by 1970, recreational drug use was perceived as bad, and Congress didn't consider the right to use drugs a right protected by the Constitution, and banned marijuana in the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. A lot of people became concerned with drugs for the first time in the 60s, because young people were using them with such uh, seeming uh, freedom and, uh, and recklessness. Um, they were particularly concerned about marijuana. The new federal law is on firm constitutional ground, unlike the self-incriminating tax of 1937. But still, marijuana use does not end. It just becomes illegal and finds a place in a subculture of its own that includes a comedy troupe and a magazine. Unlike pot, methamphetamine is not completely illegal. It can still be prescribed by doctors, but illegal, non-medicinal use is at an all-time high. It's estimated that by 1971, so many amphetamine pills were produced illicitly that there were 
They, if you gave them to every man, woman, and child in the country, you would give them 50 apiece. Methamphetamine is banned for non-medicinal use. Still, it is manufactured illegally in all 50 states. Missouri and Utah can claim the dubious prize as meth lab capitals of the U.S. Naively and innocently put on the market as the benzedrine inhaler almost 70 years ago, no one could predict amphetamine's damage. People who used a lot of amphetamines tended to be trigger happy about violence. First of all, they were become a little paranoid and they misinterpret something and think that that person is out to do them harm and they, uh, you know, give them a punch or, or worse. Amphetamines are also the preferred drug of the sports world. Pro football, horse racing, and bicycle racing are breeding grounds for speed abuse. While racing the Tour de France, Tommy Simpson collapses and dies under the influence of methamphetamine. Speed kills by blowing your heart up. Uh, it actually can blow your heart up. I mean, you'll, you'll get the heart muscle, you'll get it to rip a hole in itself. You'll, uh, it, the messages that are being sent by the brain are uh, just completely out of whack. Recreational use of this addictive drug ruins thousands of lives. Despite its dangers, its powers of addiction claim new addicts every day. That first shot of speed was like having an orgasm. I didn't have to have a man. I didn't have to have anybody. I just stood there and backed up and sat down on the couch, and it was, it was unbelievable. And it was a rush, a high that um, I knew I had found what I was looking for in my whole life. And I was off and running. While amphetamines have long been prescribed by doctors, medicinal marijuana has only gained acceptance in the 90s. Today, it is used by AIDS and cancer patients to stimulate appetite and reduce the nausea from chemotherapy. It's also a treatment for glaucoma. The attitude of the American public towards marijuana is most fickle. Once, the federal government was opposed to a national marijuana law, but enacted one anyway in 1937, only to see it overturned 30 years later by the Supreme Court. In 1970, a new federal law banned marijuana again, citing it was of no medicinal use. But today, marijuana is used legally for that very reason. Now, at the turn of the 21st century, 11 states have decriminalized possession of small amounts of marijuana, judging the legal side effects to be more harmful than the drug itself. <laughs> 